Welcome to Stay Calm and Well, the webinar series part four. I uh, can't believe we've been doing this series now for about a year. Uh, it's been pretty crazy, but i um, very glad to have everyone join us and glad that we are able to continue to build on the skills and the resilience uh, strategies that we've been discussing throughout the last year. So uh, welcome back. We're glad to have you. And if you're new, welcome. Welcome to the Stay Calm and Well webinar series. Um, so a couple of housekeeping items. First, uh, there's closed captioning available. If you click in your Zoom menu, you'll see the CC down there where it says live transcript. If you click that, you're able to have the captions pop up for you. Feel free to use those throughout the series. Um, second, if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, please use the Q&A feature. If someone has a question similar to yours, uh, use the little thumbs up like button on that and it will pop the most liked questions up to the top and then we'll get to those at the end of the session. So with that, additionally, all of our webinars are recorded. They'll be posted on our u.osu website, um, hopefully by next Monday uh, during each week. So we'll do our best to get those there as quickly as we can. Um, so finally, uh, today, we're going to have our first session. It's about lessons learned from centenarians, evidence-based tactics that lead to high quality longevity with Bern Melnick, our university chief wellness officer. So uh, with that, I will pass it over to Bern. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks, David. I am so excited to be back with all of you. Congratulations. We made it. There were a lot of character builders that we all experienced this past year. But the fact that we're here, we're really starting to turn the corner on this pandemic now is such a relief. So we wanted to continue this series because we've gotten such great feedback on it. Before you joined, I asked David and Rebecca, do you get excited about thinking that you might live to be a centenarian, a hundred years old. And David responded, it all depends on what quality that would be. I will tell you, I gave a similar presentation to a group of seniors, average age of 93 last month. And they had a twinkle in their eye and a fire in their belly at the age of 93. So I'm gonna share best evidence with all of you. How can you continue to lead a very long, healthy, high quality life. So in 2010, that's the latest data we have. We, the census estimated that the population had 50,000 people who were at least a hundred years of age. That's in the United States. The current estimation based on growth rates, we probably have about 90,000 people across the United States who have reached the age of a hundred. Data from the Nationally Representative Health and Retirement Study suggests centenarians are generally healthier than non-surviving members of their cohort. And 23%, 23% reach the age of 100 with no major chronic diseases. And what's 
really striking 55% of centenarians have no cognitive impairment at the age of 100. So what makes a centenarian? Well, the blue zones, as all of you probably know, are spots across the world where people live really long, healthy lives. And they have the most centenarians. That includes places like Sardinia, Italy, Icaria in Greece, Okinawa, Japan, but also Loma Linda in California. So these are all hot spots. Dan Buettner went around the world looking for these longevity hotspots and identifying patterns of behavior that really led to leading long, healthy lives. In these spots, people moved more. So you all have heard me all the time say here, we've got to create a culture where movement is the norm. Healthy eating is the norm. We've got to make it easy and fun to do healthy behaviors. So people in these blue zones, not only did they move more, eat healthy, they had positive outlooks and the right tribe. That means they socially connected on a regular basis. And those four attributes were identified as really very key factors to leading long, healthy lives. So centenarians in those hot spots were extremely committed to healthy behaviors and habits. As you all know, we've got a big dream at this university that we're very committed to achieving. And that is to be the healthiest university on the planet. And why do we continue to invest in wellness because we care about our Buckeye family first and foremost. We want all of our Buckeye family to be happy, healthy, and engaged. And to get us there, we have to build cultures of well being where these healthy behaviors are the norm. Everything or most everything we do here at Ohio State to help you lead a long, healthy life is based on best evidence. We have a philosophy and that is in God we trust but everybody else better bring data to the table. So I wanna give you a little more data right now. Americans have a shorter life expectancy compared with populations of comparable Western world countries. One of the reasons I believe we have a lower life expectancy is unlike these other countries, only 
percent of our health care spending in the United States is invested in wellness and in prevention. Remember, 80 percent of chronic disease is totally preventable if we would just all engage in these lifestyle factors, not smoking, maintaining healthy weight, regular physical activity, healthy eating, and limiting our alcohol intake. But the Centers for Disease Control did a study and they found only 6% of Americans actually engaged in these leading health indicators. The formula is simple. It truly is, but it's not easy. Even our own behaviors are what I call character building to change. We got to find our big reason to wake up every morning, get motivated, to move more, to sit less, to eat healthy, making sure we're getting at least seven hours asleep a night. Unfortunately, six out of 10 people in the United States have a chronic disease. But again, 80% of chronic disease is totally preventable with just a few healthy lifestyle behaviors. Habits though, take at least 30 to 60 days to change. And if you're sitting right now, I'd encourage you to stand up like I am. I truly spend at least 80% of the workday standing. So if you'd like to lead a high quality life, free from chronic disease. All you have to do is these six evidence-based tactics. Eat and drink healthy. Move more, sit less. Don't use tobacco. Get regular checkups. Adhere to the United States Preventive Services Task Force recommendations on screenings like colon cancer, breast cancer screening. Know your family history because genetics do play a role in what happens to us, but more powerful than genetics is what we do our behaviors. And then we've got to be in tune to any changes in our brain health. The earlier that we can catch things, the better prognosis that we have. So it's small choices that become actions. Actions become habits, and habits become our way of life and what we do every day. Again, it takes 30 to 60 days to change, to make, or to break a new habit. We can't get discouraged if on day 10, we fall off the wagon. It's okay. Just get back on and start again, because we're all human. But you've heard me over and over again. If we sit for prolonged periods of time, three hours a day of sitting 
even increases our cardiac risk. But to know these facts and not to do them is really not to know on a very deep level. I can spew out so much evidence for all of you. The dangers of sitting, the dangers of not engaging in physical activity or eating healthy. But bottom line, you have to find your emotional reason to change. My emotional reason is my family, my daughters, my two little grandsons. I want to be around for them for quite some time to come. Well, I want you to take this sitting fact challenge and just answer true or false to each of these items. The average U.S. adult spends 34 hours a week watching TV. That's true. So while we watch TV, have your exercise band, stand up, do some resistance training. Most of us spend more time sitting than sleeping. That's true. Smokers lose 11 minutes of light per cigarette they smoke, but for every hour of sitting, we shorten our lives by 22 minutes. That's true. And epidemiological data from almost 1 million people links excess sitting to 34 chronic diseases including risk of colon, endometrial, and lung cancer. This study showed higher sitting times were associated with higher all-cause mortality and heart disease risk. But those associations were mostly focused on people not needing the physical activity recommendations, needing even the lower 150 minutes a week of physical activity eliminated the association of sitting with all cause mortality. So bottom line again, sit less, stand more, move more. You will also have so much energy and so much less brain fog if you move more and sit less. So this was a recent study that was obtained by thousands of men and women. They found replacing just 30 minutes of sitting with 30 minutes of light activity was associated with a 14% mortality risk reduction. So again, bottom line, if you sit hours a day, set a SMART goal. I'm just going to sit to begin with 30 minutes less a day. Again, you will have more energy if you stand more and sit less. Well, the pandemic has caused an epidemic of mental health issues. Latest studies show that one out of three Americans right now are suffering from clinical depression or anxiety. Burnout has skyrocketed. 
And I will just reinforce, if you find yourself suffering from stress, anxiety, depression, and it's interfering with your judgment, your functioning, your ability to concentrate, please get help. We have got such wonderful resources here at our university, including five free sessions with our employee assistance program. There is no shame in needing some mental health help. Please, it's a strength to recognize when we need help and to seek it out. We've got so many studies right now, though, that do link stress, depression, and anxiety with cardiovascular risk, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, and we do see an association between anxiety disorders and an increased evidence of stroke. So again, We offer at Ohio State so many fabulous resources and programs to build resiliency in our people because resiliency is a protective factor against both mental health problems and chronic disease. So again, we know anxiety, depression, chronic stress, plays havoc, not only with our cardiovascular system, but with our brain health and with our immune system. So again, I so encourage all of you, participate, engage in all of the wonderful programs health coaching, other resources we have here at the university to decrease your stress, anxiety, and depression. Well, Benjamin Franklin was so very wise when he said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We would not send divers into a deep ocean without an oxygen tank. We cannot send our Buckeye family, our students, our faculty and staff throughout their lives without equipping them, boosting their resilience and their protective factors which is why, again, our university invests so much in wellness. We have our CBT skills building program that really teaches people how you think directly relates to how you feel and how you behave. And if you attended my lecture, on CBT skills building, you know that I encourage you to catch, check, and change your automatic negative thoughts. So when you are feeling stressed, angry, anxious, or depressed, stop. Say to yourself, what am I just thinking? Is that thought really true? Do I have the evidence to back it up? Is it helpful? Chances are the answer is going to be no. So the key again is to catch those negative thoughts, check them with these questions, turn them around from negative to positive to feel emotionally better. And every day, We've got to program our brains with positive thoughts because positive in 
results in positive thinking and emotions out. And a very simple practice to help program your brain is just to get a positive self-statement, something that you can really relate to. My favorite, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Say it out loud 10 times every morning, every night. That simple practice has been shown to have multiple benefits within the brain. These are some of my favorite books. And for the last 35 years, I get up every day and with my cup of coffee, I pick up a positive book. Read five minutes. You can do that every morning, every night. You'd be amazed at how much better you'd feel. And even if you don't feel like exercising, you don't feel like practicing mindfulness, do it anyway. The after effects you'll so benefit from. That's called behavioral activation. Now, many of you have heard me say, worry about the future, guilt about the past are the two most wasted emotions that we have. So the best thing we can do for full engagement, not multitask, and stay in the present moment. It's one of the best habits you can develop to worry less and feel less guilt. And then this is so quick, so easy, but so powerful. Take your dose of vitamin G every morning, every night. We have so much research to show. If we just get up every morning, every night, count our blessings, people, things, pets, we're grateful for. We'll have improved mood, heart health, optimism, we'll sleep better, and our blood pressure will be improved. Another simple strategy, take five deep or even three deep abdominal breaths using five, seven, eight. Breathe in, count to five, hold the breath for seven, and breathe out, counting to eight. That really cuts your sympathetic response. You feel less stressed. Your heart rate, your blood pressure drops. So I launched this mask on, mood up movement last month. And what I'm doing is asking everybody, when you put on your mask every time, just do these three evidence-based tactics. Take three abdominal deep breaths using five, seven, eight. Be kind to yourself. Say a self-affirmation statement out loud 10 times. And then think of somebody you're grateful for and turn around and let that person know you will make their whole week. Well, for those of you who are managers and supervisors, we have our Leading Well series starting on Tuesdays, March 23rd. Please join us. We're going to give you great evidence-based tips on creating a culture of wellness and support for your people. So I'm going to end my talk to ask you, consider today, your January 1. What will you do in the next 30 to 60 days? 
with one of those behaviors I pointed out, just to get a little healthier. My mom stroked out and died right in front of me when I was 15 years of age. She had uncontrolled high blood pressure. So it's really important that you know your numbers, you get your blood pressure checked regularly, but find your why. It's not selfish to take good self-care. We cannot pour from an empty cup. So put your loved ones in front of you when you don't feel like exercising, eating healthy, practicing mindfulness. Let them be your motivators. And again, just Choose one goal the next 30 days. Take the first step. Write the goal down. Put a date on it. Put it where you can see it every single day. It will help to motivate you. This gentleman received his degree at 105 years of age. People who have purpose and passion live seven years longer than people who don't. Get aligned again, start dreaming again. Get your passion in front of you. Because if you are aligned with your dreams and your passions, every day. You'll never feel like you work a day in your life. So stay tuned for a great lecture next week on overcoming pandemic paralysis by Shannon Carter. Thanks so much for being with us today. I'll stick around a few minutes for some questions. Thank you and go Buckeye. All right, so we've got a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, we'll do we'll do as many as we can. We'll only stay for a couple of minutes here. I know it's it's already a little past one, but Vern, the first one is: What can one do if we feel our brain health is declining, like we're feeling more forgetful? Yeah, I think the first thing to do is see your primary care nurse practitioner or doctor because they're screening assessments. It could be nothing but stress and fatigue. But if it's happening on a regular basis, I would want you to first get checked out. Once you know there's nothing physiologically going on with you, then I would work to increase your brain health. Do puzzles. Do things where you got to work at it a little bit, but very importantly, get physical activity in. It's one of the best things you can do for your heart and your brain health. Okay, so this next one's a little, little longer. So it says, I have a lot of knowledge on what to do, yet struggle with the motivation and action part. More on the cognitive behavioral cognitive behavioral part of being healthy. Since having COVID, I feel like this has been even worse because I feel my brain is very sluggish. I suffer from a lot of chronic pain, which some of which I'm sure uh, would decrease significantly if I were to be healthier. However, it is a bit of a catch-22 because it is hard to feel like you want to move and do things when you are in pain. Any suggestions? Yeah, I think this is where you got to find your why. Because again, you know it. You're telling me by your question. You know you'd feel better if you do certain things. Now it's time to find your why. Evidence plus emotions get us motivated to contemplate a change. Unfortunately, most people don't change unless crisis happens. 
So getting to that emotional arousal piece, thinking about, again, even if I don't do it for myself, who are my loved ones that still want me around? It's going to be really important to reflect on the reason. And the question I ask people that sometimes helps them to find their motivation is what are you going to do? What will you do in the next five years if you absolutely know you cannot fail? Because a lot of people through this pandemic have lost their ability to dream. They really have. You're not alone. Fatigue is high. Burnout is high right now. And we've got to help each other get dreaming again, get goals that excite us again. I know you can do that. Uh, one person asks if 20 hours of standing as a part-time cashier will make up for all the sit, uh, sitting during telework for Ohio State. That's, that's a great question. Um, the research actually shows that even if you exercise, get your 150 minutes of the recommended amount of physical activity in a week, even if you do that, and you do prolonged sitting, the prolonged sitting is still going to increase your risk. So I'd like to tell you, if you exercise, yes, exercise alone is going to help, but the prolonged sitting still has its adverse outcomes. Great, Bern. Uh, That was the last of the questions that we had. So I think we will wrap it up for today. Uh, Thanks for joining everyone. And uh, we will see you next week. Great. Bye, everybody. Go Buckeyes.